Hello everyone. The topic of my second presentation is on the appearance of lips and more specifically what characteristics make lips appear attractive and some ways to achieve attractive looking lips. When most people are asked to define attractive lips, they will tend to describe voluminous and glowy lips that remind you of the lips of the famous actress Angelina Jolie. While we have a general idea of what attractive lips look like, there is a lack of criteria that helps us accurately distinguish attractive lips from unattractive lips. Today, I will be discussing three papers related to this topic that will help us learn more about the characteristics of attractive lips, some gender and cultural differences that exist regarding the proportions and angles of attractive lips, and lastly, available surgical procedures that help patients achieve their desired lips. The first paper focuses on determining features such as proportions and angles that influence the appearance of lips. Past studies have assessed average proportions of the perioral region by using classical anthropometric landmarks, but they do not refer to the proportions or angles of the perfect-looking lips. Also, there are numerous studies revealing ideal facial proportions, eyes, and nose regions, but not the lips. Therefore, the authors of the study aim to analyze features that make lips appear attractive and find out if certain proportions or angles differed between males and females. Photos from a total of 176 Caucasians aged between 18 to 30 years were used in this study. The photos were taken from the frontal and lateral views. 250 jurors evaluated these photos and rated each one based on the Likert scaling system, where one being the score given to an absolutely attractive looking lips and seven to an absolutely unattractive lips. Then they performed a photomorphometric analysis by selecting images with highest and lowest scores to obtain angle and proportion measurements. A t-test was carried out to see if there was a significant difference in the two groups at the extreme ends. These are the proportion and angle measurements that the authors based their study off of. The red line refers to the upper vermilion height. Turquoise line is the mouth to nose distance. Orange line is the lower vermilion height. The black line is the mouth width. And purple line is the chin to mouth distance. The angle indicated in yellow is the nasolabial angle and the angle between green lines is the mentolabial angle. Figure A is an example of a male's frontal view picture that received a Likert score of 1 or 2, a score given to highly attractive looking perioral region of the face. Figure B is a lateral view of a female who received a Likert score of 1 or 2. Figure C and D are pictures of a male and female, respectively. They both received six or seven Likert scores, indicating that these photos were considered to have unattractive perioral regions. The results showed that the ratio of upper vermilion height and mouth-to-nose distance in females were greater in the groups that received lower scores. The same trend was observed in upper vermilion height and chin to nose distance ratio of the lateral view as well as in the frontal view. The mentolabial angle and nasolabial angle of females in the lateral view exhibited opposing results. The mentolabial angle was greater in the Likert one or two group, while the nasolabial angle 
was greater in the Likert 6 or 7 group. The stars above the bars indicate p-values less than 0.05, meaning that these differences are significant. In males, the ratio of the upper vermilion height and mouth-to-nose distance was greater in the Likert 1 or 2 group, similar to the results of the females. The ratios of the measurements in both genders were compared and the results showed that the ratios were higher in females for both lower vermilion height and chin-to-mouth distance and vermilion height and chin-to-nose distance. This is a summary of the results. The greater the upper and lower vermilion height, the more attractive the lips appear in females. In males, Greater upper vermilion height was considered more attractive than lower upper lower vermilion height, but lesser lower vermilion height was preferred in males. These are the examples of attractive versus unattractive perioral regions. The left-hand sides of each group of photos are photos of female and male with attractive perioral regions. The photos on the right are female and male with unattractive perioral regions. Certain features did correspond to the perceived attractiveness. The height of lower vermilion in relation to the chin-to-mouth distance and chin-to-nose distance ratios were much higher in the attractive female group indicating that full lips do represent attractive lips in females. Although larger mouths are generally considered attractive, the ratio of mouth width and chin-to-nose distance did not show any significant difference in attractive compared to unattractive male and female perioral regions, or in attractive female perioral regions compared to attractive male perioral regions. This shows that larger mouth does not necessarily add to an individual's appeal, as it has previously been pointed out by another researcher. Also, a prominent chin in males are usually perceived as an attractive trait, but the lack of difference in nasal and mentolabial angles between the attractive and unattractive male groups indicate that nasolabial and mentolabial angles do not have a significant effect on the male attractiveness. Some other things to consider, especially about setting parameters, is that one's perception of beauty is dependent on ethnic, demographic, or occupational factors. One's culture can have a huge impact on the perception of beauty, and so the findings of this study may only apply to the Central European population. Also, there is a chance that the evaluation was biased since one might perceive certain facial structures as being more attractive than others because they resemble the characteristics of ones they love or care for. Moving on to the second paper, this paper focuses on the cultural aspects. With globalization, plastic surgeons are tempted to create unified surgical goals, but the perception of beauty is not the same across the world. Also, other factors such as age, gender, and occupation are likely to impact the perception of lip attractiveness. The aim of the study was to inform plastic surgeons with lip size preferences of the different groups of people and whether these differences are significant. An online survey was created asking for participants to fill out information about their age, gender, country of residence, ethnic background, number of lip augmentation performed if the participant is a surgeon, and the choice of attractive lip size based on the provided pictures with varying lip sizes. 
The online survey was sent out to a total of 9,000 plastic surgeons and lay people from 35 different countries, and 14% responded. These are the photos that the participants were asked to choose from. The participants were able to decrease or increase the lip size from the default photo by clicking on the decrease or increase button. They were allowed to select only one photo that they thought was the most attractive out of the seven photos. These are the demographics of the participants. As you can see here, the response rates for females and males were about the same for lay people, and a higher percentage of males responded in the surgeon's group. The age groups responding to the survey were mostly 20 to 39 years in the lay people group and 40 to 59 years in the surgeon's group. Participants living in Europe responded the most and Caucasians were among the most common ethnical groups. This shows the impact of the surgeon's country of residence on lip size preferences. Notice how the mean is greatest in the surgeon's group living in Asia. Moving on to the impact of surgeon's ethnicity on lip size preferences, the mean was greatest in the non-Caucasian group. The lip size preferences did not significantly differ across plastic surgeons' gender, age, type of practice, or with the amount of yearly performed lip augmentations. Lastly, the impact of lay people's country of residence on lip size preferences were determined. The mean value was highest in the Latin America group, while the lowest was in the Asia group. This is the summary of results. Asian or non-Caucasian surgeons preferred larger lips. European and Caucasian surgeons preferred smaller lips. Lay people living in Latin America preferred larger lips, lay people living in Asia preferred the smallest lips, and no significant difference was found across age, gender, or income. The results of the study highly suggest that the perceptions of lip attractiveness vary greatly depending on the ethnic and cultural backgrounds of the participants. This indicates that surgeons should not rely solely on universal parameters and try to meet the preferences of each individual. It is important to note that there is a paradox in the results, and that is, the preference for lip size differ between surgeons and lay people in Asia. Asian surgeons prefer larger lips, while lay people living in Asia prefer smaller lips. This difference should not be ignored as a difference in the perceptions of the two groups might result in the dissatisfaction of patients. The authors of the study predicted that the reasons for this difference are that plastic surgeons are trained to evaluate facial form in a certain way, which is actually not accurate considering the preference of actual patients. Also. They suggest that this difference might be due to the tendencies that surgeons might overestimate what patients want. As a result, it is crucial that there is clear communication between the surgeon and patient. There are some limitations to this study, and in fact, numerous studies focusing on this topic are limited as the surveyors are asked to choose the most attractive picture in these kinds of studies. This could introduce bias since other factors such as skin color of the model might affect one's decision. Also, using only the face of one model may be less ideal than comparing different real faces with different features. But using multiple pictures would mean 
that the actual proportions of lip size and shape would have to be calculated each time because a model with big lips in a larger person might evoke the same sense of ideal proportion sensed when small lips are paired with a smaller face. Lastly, the results of the study is subject to change over time since beauty trends like fashion change all the time. According to research, lip augmentation increased by 43% since year 2000, and this might have resulted from how lip augmentations were portrayed in the media. Kylie Jenner, the so-called trendsetter, admitted using fillers to augment her lips, and that resulted in a major increase in internet searches and inquiries in plastic surgery clinics for lip augmentation in the United States and Europe. The last paper talks about how we can actually shape lips the way we want. The lips are often considered to be one of the most beautiful features of the face along with the eyes. Aging processes or hereditary factors contribute to the loss of lip volume and fillers are often used to solve these issues. While the use of fillers is not new at all, this study was performed to introduce a lip injection procedure in detail, which would help clinicians achieve optimum results. It is important that practitioners are aware of the basic anatomy of the perioral region. The upper lip extends from the base of the nose superiorly to the nasolabial folds laterally and to the free edge of the vermilion border inferiorly. The lower lip extends from the superior free vermilion edge superiorly to the commissures laterally and to the mandible inferiorly. Along the upper vermilion border, two paramedian elevations of the ver vermilion form the cupid's bow. Two raised Vertical columns of tissue form a midline depression called the philtrum. Hyaluronic acid and polyacrylamide fillers are among the most common types of fillers used on the lips. Usually, the upper lip requires more filling than the lower since the upper lip tends to lack volume compared to the lower lip. To patients who have genetically thin lips, the injection at the deeper layer should be performed, followed by superficial injections to make minor volume adjustments. For pure augmentation of the lips, injections are made superficially. Also, it is important that over-volumization on male lips is avoided as it could make them look more feminine. A cannula is much more recommended than a needle, and only one point each on either side of the oral commissure is utilized to reach both the upper and the lower lip. This technique needs getting used to, and it's difficult for a beginner to perform. These are the before and after photos of lip injections with one milliliter of hyaluronic acid injection in both upper and lower lips. As you can see, the lips look much more voluminous and plump compared to the relatively flat upper lips shown in the before picture. Swelling and bruising are common side effects of lip injections and the use of cannulae instead of needles are recommended to reduce or prevent them. Also, 
Any history of herpes labialis should be taken into account before the procedure, and the intake of aspirin and vitamin E should be consulted beforehand as well. Complications such as nodules and lumps are extremely rare, and they can be massaged in or dissolved with hyaluronidase injections. The picture on the left is an example of swelling immediately after a hyaluronic acid injection, and the picture on the right is an example of herpetic reactivation after injection. Some preventative measures such as acyclovir and famcyclovir are used to suppress the herpetic reaction. The authors emphasized that to achieve optimal results, knowledge of the lip anatomy and function is necessary, as well as the techniques used and clinical experiences of the professionals. Also, individualized treatment approach is necessary since patients all have different lip shapes and preferences. All of the papers that we just discussed point toward the same conclusion. There is no universal agreement on what attractive lips should look like or a lip augmentation procedure applica applicable to all patients. Therefore, practitioners should consult with their patients thoroughly before performing any procedures. These are the list of references in the order that they were presented. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.